told us as follows. Now, we did this post yesterday that the Asaf Sufa Sherbakarvo, that uh, the gathering, the group that gathered up that was there, it's Avu Tava. Um, by the way, do you want your Rashimo? Do you know where I put the Chumash you were using? Oh, it's over there. So, oh, beautiful. So they had a desire, the Yashuvu Vayivku, and they sat there and they cried. And what did they want? Who's going to give us meat? It's like the people saying, who's going to give us internet? They said, who's going to give us meat? Right. So that's a very good question. Didn't they have a valid claim? And we looked at this yesterday. But they had meat. So was it a valid claim? The Chiloyo and Basar, did they not have meat? But doesn't it already state that they had the sheep and the cattle when they were in? So they were just looking for a pretext. That was what we said in yesterday's Rashi. Because we know that when they went to the land of Israel, they had, they had, they had the cattle from Reuven and God. So this was just a, uh, a pretext. So now we're up to the next verse. And now this is my, my favorite pasuk in the whole Torah. Shows you human psychology. They said, They said, we remember the fish that we ate in Egypt for free. And then the cucumbers, the watermelons, the... Uh, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. So first of all, before we even get to Rashi, you ate it for free? Hello? <laughs> you ate the fish for free? You didn't eat the fish for free. You were working as slaves. Just because you didn't eat it for free, just because you didn't pay cash for it, doesn't mean you ate it for free. There's a lot of ways to pay for something, and cash is the cheapest. So, you know, it's like the person, like if you're working in the company, and the company says, oh, we're going to give you a free dinner, if you work here, if you're working here till nine o'clock, we'll give you a free dinner. No, they're working you so you can't go home and eat dinner like a mensch. And then they say, we're giving you a free dinner. There's nothing free about that dinner. Now, number two, they say, we remember the fish that we ate for free. And then they say all those other things. Those other things weren't for free. The cucumbers, the, um, the uh, watermelons, the, the leeks, that stuff wasn't free. It was just the fish that was free. And we remember the, everybody else was eating it for free. Uh, Seth, you a, a, no, it's a, first of all, um, on that point, it's a slave mentality. Yeah. You know, that's, that's that they're still in. If they're saying it now, they're for still sure. in it and they're about to go, they're going to beg in, in, to, in the next part, should I go back to Egypt anyway? And that's what I think this is, but that's not what I wanted to ask you. Oh, okay. I wanted to add, I know that I wanted you to do the Rashi first and then you can come okay. back. I didn't want to, okay, I want to hear Rashi. Has so Rashi has to say the following. If you're going to think that the Egyptians actually gave him fish for free, they don't even give you straw. <laughs> if they wouldn't even give them straw, are going to give them fish? So what does it mean when it says that we ate the fish for free? So they ate the fish free of any mitzvos. Well, what does that mean? What do you mean they ate the fish free of mitzvah? So I'm not sure. Like, there's two ways to understand it. Meaning maybe they had, didn't have to do any mitzvahs associated with it. They didn't have to make a bracha. They didn't have to uh, give to do the tithes on all these fruit. Or else it can mean fish could be a euphemism. Euphemism. Fish is a euphemism for uh, for other things, that they were free of mitzvahs, they didn't have to observe any commandments. My Rebbe in 11th grade used to quote, only when you're dead, you're free. <laughs> Thank you, Ronnie. That's the third night in a row that Ronnie's been here at the yeshiva. She's becoming a real- Ronnie, I wouldn't know, my question actually was involving a medical issue. Okay, so let's hear it, let's hear it. The question was, the, the, the Rebbe Skomish says that these items, leeks and garlic and cucumbers, actually were not good for the fetus leg, that it caused problems from nursing mothers. Is there any validity to that? Think carefully. You want to argue with the Rebbe? <laughs> I think uh, when Tom Brady wanted those kind of foods as well, so there may be some theory about. What do they call the kind of foods? They're called the um, that's the ones the people who have 
like tomatoes and onions yeah. and beans. Nightshades. And nightshades. Nightshades. Nightshades, yes. Yes. So there may be something. Uh, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Well, I was suggesting to Ronnie that she write a book about popular neurology, tell people like, here's 10 tips to avoid a migraine, 10 tips to avoid memory loss when you grow older. Who would read that book? Would you read that, Alan? Is that your question? Well, then he says, it's, it's more. Have you heard about this finish that basically, that not only- No, Alan, it's up there. The Not problem, only Alan, does the, the problem is manna, there in the the, these flavors cause problems for yeah. nursing mothers. So there was this thing that people didn't want people to think, oh, they're going to enjoy them. So they wouldn't allow the manna to taste like these flavors. Did you ever hear anything like this? That they wouldn't eat those foods because they didn't want the manna to taste like that. That I never heard. Read that out loud. Okay. Yeah, it's says, a true, the manna tastes like whatever we wanted to, except for these beneficial foods, because their flavors are considered harmful to nursing infants. But since Hashem can do anything, he could have excluded these flavors from the manna only for nursing mothers. Clearly, he was just trying to vex us. In fact, Hashem excluded these flavors from the manna because if the nursing mothers would see everyone else enjoying them, they would want to taste them, them in the manna okay. too. And once they desired them, it would automatically taste them. And these Beautiful. tastes would then go into the milk and harm the babies. Okay, I never heard that. That's okay, that, I just needed to, I never yeah, heard it. never heard it. Beautiful. And uh, Jerry, Jerry, yes. Uh, this... Uh, this is the beginning of vegetarianism. Uh, the manna is uh, not uh, meat. So the uh, Torah uh, is uh, promoting vegetarianism. I want to tell you something. When I was in, uh, well, no, that's, they didn't just only eat that in the wilderness. They also ate the other things in the wilderness. They had the meat. We just, told, we just saw that they had sacrifices. But there was something else. When I was in Saudi Arabia, I, I said to them, do they have a tradition here about what they, by the way, I did not take part in the uh, PGA tour of those billions that they're offering the players. I was just there like a pauper. <laughs> so they, uh, they, um, they, I said to them, is there a tradition of what is the mana? So like, do they have a tradition of which vegetable is the mana? And they, um, they told me they have the following tradition. Um, hold on. Let me find this person. He sent it to me. Let me see if I can find it. Here we go. He said to me, uh, he told me to go around and, hold on one second. Mugmar. Oh, no, no. It's called, uh, I don't know. They had something. Mugmar means spice in Aramaic. But anyway, he told me they had something and they sell it in every store. We couldn't find it, but that was their tradition that that was the mana. Okay, that was that. The, I, excuse yeah. me, these are Arabs uh, speaking or Jew, Jews that are speaking to both, you? Both, both, both. Both. There was one rabbi who was the rabbi, of, I don't know, maybe it's more than one rabbi. There was one rabbi who I was speaking to. He was the rabbi of uh, Saudi Arabia. And then he sent to us a mashkiach. This mashkiach is a great guy. And he's a follower of you on our YouTube channel. So maybe he's uh, actually going to be listening to our shear because sometimes he listens in. And he, this guy, just to show you what kind of righteous person he is, he once, there was a woman in Iraq who needed his help and he needed to get there from Israel. What did he do? He got a car from Ukraine with Ukrainian plates. He drove over the Allenby Bridge and then just kept driving straight to Iraq. He drove from Israel to Iraq. Yeah. Anyway, go on. We go on. So now the verse states, "Vaman kizra God." Oh, okay. Vatan nafshenu yevesha. Ain kol bilti el aman inenu. But now our life is dry. There's nothing except before our eyes, except for the mana. Oh wait, wait. I skipped the Rashi. The kishuim, the cucumbers. I skipped all that Rashi. What does this mean? Amar Rabbi Shimon mema haman mishtanel kol davar. Oh, Seth. But you were quoting to me was the Rashi. I know I, that's why I didn't. I didn't. You didn't finish, and I thought I didn't see the other Rashi. Oh, that's why I wanted you to do it oh, first. Oh yeah, yeah, fine, 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 fine. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this, and I did this Rashi last year. Just my memory is shot. I don't have a memory. So I'm Rabbi Shimon. Why did the man? Why was the man? Um, 
change to every flavor except for these foods. Because these foods are harmful for nursing mothers. So therefore, Omrim Isha, they say to the woman, don't eat garlic or onion because of the child. This is compared to a human king. So God excluded, so that's why they were asking for these foods, because God didn't like the mud, taste like these foods, because the flavor would get the nursing mother and make it difficult. Well, I'm wondering if they're saying today that the nursing mothers or the pregnant mothers should stay inside because of these very bad air control. So now, I, this was the first day I didn't jog. I usually jog every day outside, but I, I, my wife told me not to today. I'm sorry, Jerry, I cut when you is, off. Yeah, I'm sorry. What is the, uh, the background of this parable that's hinted at? It, it doesn't give you the full story. The you full story is that the- Hashem would make the man taste like whatever you wanted, except for these food items. Oh, you mean the human king? Right. So the the full human king is is from the Sifre. Uh, the Sifre tells us that there's a, a human king, and he put a tutor in charge of his son, and he gives him orders and tells him, I don't want you to him to eat harmful food or drink harmful drink. Like, don't give him heroin or or beer. And the son got upset against his father and and said, He's not doing this to help me. It's only because he hates me. So the father doesn't give their kid heroin, and the kid and the kid rails against the father. They don't realize that the father is doing it out of love. So that's why Hashem Yisbarach didn't give our ancestors these foods out of the man because he was doing it to help us. Hakishuim she quotes the old French. I just cool. shared the the, the midrash. Okay, the the cucumbers are heim cucumberish collage. This is cucumbers in French. It's in modern French, concombre. And avatichem is bodix. In old French, bodekes. And in modern French, pastique, which is watermelons. Uh, um, so, by the way, Rashi is bodeke, which became patique, patek, and finally pastique in modern French, is a corruption of the Arabic albatika, which is almost identical to our word avatiach. Very nice. Hechatsir, this is creation, leeks. Purely, purels in French. Pour yo. Vitargumo, yat putsina, yat avatijo, karate Cucumbers, the watermelon, and the leeks. The cucumbers, the watermelon, and the leeks. Okay. Then, okay. Hech, okay, fine. Now then, and then we have nothing in front of us. Our legs are dry except for the mud. Man ba shachar, man ba Arab. Man in the morning, man in the evening. So this is very interesting. What is the problem here? So the Amek on Nitziv says, even though the man could taste like whatever they wanted, the problem was not the taste, the problem was the appearance. It always looked the same, and that's what got them upset. They didn't like the way it looked. <laughs> it sounds ungrateful, but we've all been there on both ends of this, that we've all complained when we've been ungrateful, and also people have been complaining to us when they're not supposed to. So we've all done it both. But they got sick of it. You know what? They got sick of it. I'm sorry to say. The man was like the coriander seed, and its color was like the color of the bedoach. What does that mean? Rashi says, Misha Amarzeh, Rashi says, one who said this, Amarzeh, Yisro Omrim, the, the Jewish people said, so Rashi tells us we have to read this verse like this. The Jewish people said, Bilti Amane Nenu. We have nothing before our eyes but the man. Vakarish Prochu, Yachtiv Batorah, Vaman Kizra God. So the Jewish people said, we have nothing in front of our eyes but the man. And God said, but the man was like coriander. He says, look, the people are complaining about the man, but the man was like coriander seed, which is a very good thing. The whole irony is, you know, like, what else is everybody else eating? It wasn't like they had a supermarket like we have today, where you go into the supermarket and you have aisles and aisles of food. Everybody else was had like five or six food items. 
they didn't have so many things. Especially in the desert. Especially in the desert, yeah. So what did they eat? They always, so this was like a rare thing, the coriander seed. So he said, look, the man was delicious. The people would go out, even if we don't go to the Midrash, which says it tastes like whatever they want. The man could be like anything. People would go out for a stroll. They would gather it up. Oh, I skipped the Rosh. We'll have to come back to that. They, 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 they grind it up in the mill or they pound it in a mortar and they cooked it baparur, and they cooked it in a pot, they made it into cakes and it tasted like the taste of dough kneaded with oil. Mm. Rashi says, let's go to the Rashi. Kizara got a gida, it's round like a gida. Zera koyanda, bedoach shem evan tova, it's the name of a fine stone, crystal in old French. Shatu, they go out in shayet awashon tiyol, they go for a stroll, bo ama, without exertion. They didn't have to work hard. They didn't have to go take an Uber to the store. They just went out and they found it. And tachanu berechaim, they were grinded in a mill. Lo yarad berechaim, didn't come down into a mill. Bo bekadera, nor into a kettle, bo bemaducha, el mishtanel yatamo. Its flavor would change. Unetachen, unidochen, unvushan. Means that he didn't actually grind it or cook it or put it in a mortar, but rather Rashi says its flavor would change and it would change, it would taste as though it was ground, as though it was pounded, as though it was cooked. But parur, that means a kadeira, that means a pot. Mashada shemen, shemen, the moistness of oil. That's how dunash explained it. Do you know what dunash is? Very interesting. He's usually Rashi does not. Cite Dunash, Rashi. Uh, Rashi does cite Menachem more often than Dunash. So let's hear the footnote here. Tells us who Dunash is. I just one second. Let me just read this. Dunash ben Labrat lived in 10th century Fez. He composed many piyutim. The best known of which is. Mo, you ever know what the best one? Dorori Kra. Very nice, Rabbi Yosef. Dorori Kra. Wow, hard to imagine that that goes back to the, the 10th century. Donash wrote a treatise which listed 200 instances in which his understanding of the word roots disagrees with those given in the Machberis of Menachem, which set the stage for a debate that has never been settled. 200 years after the disciples of Menachem and Donash wrote treatises defending their respective works, and attacking those of others, Rabbeinu Tam wrote Sefer Achros, in which he decides the issues and vindicates, guess who was the winner, according to Rabbeinu Tam? Menachem, not Dunash. However, Rabbi Yosef Kimchi, father of Radak, responded with Sefer Agiwa in defense of Dunash. Rashi quotes both. Rabbi Yosef, you had a question? You're on mute, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, what is the source of the Midrash that somebody who sinned had to go further from his tent to to get the mana. Like, if it was a gift from God, then you know you you described it as a stroll. That, that's a great description. But why why would the midrash say that somebody who sinned, uh, you know, the next morning had to go further? Like, it didn't say its name on, you know, this is yours and this is yours. Like. I think it was from the uh, um, the other mention of man. I don't remember which uh, where Rashi says that. Bishalach. Bishalach. So it must be there. We have to have to check that. We we'll have to check it. Check it after. God willing. So then it states. Right, so yeah, Mo. It's just kind of interesting that <clears throat> right after, I mean, early in the parsha, where it's just talking. By the about, way, I just want to say, Mo. Do you know what kind of a. Uh, uh, you have you're studying with a man on the Zoom who studied with your grand with your great grandfather. With uh, Jerry, you used to study with Paul Sperling. Did you ever study with Paul Sperling, Jerry Shackman? Of course. Yo, his grand his great grandson is studying. Do you understand what a slus that is to study with uh, your great grandfather's chavrusa? 
Yeah, uh, very moving to me. Yeah, okay, Mo, what's your sheet? Um, that I mean, earlier in the part show, we were just talking about like all the korbana and everything that you do to the VM and the menorah and all these like holy things that are happening in the camp. Yeah, and then we have this complaint that I think goes farther than just food because if we go back to uh, Bab, when it's when it talks about like says like there's nothing except waiting for the man. So it's not even that like every, it's, it's it's that they they nothing else. They, their complaint is that there's literally nothing else for them to do besides waiting for like this food they don't even like to come down. So that's a very good point that the man Mo is bringing up a very good point that the man why is the man called a test? So one 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 theory about why it's a test is because they don't have to do anything. The test of too much, the test of not having to work which is an enormous test. The test of not having to work is an enormous test. The test of not knowing your purpose in life. So if every day the food is given to you and you don't have to work, can you imagine how crazy you would go out of your mind? Like if you go to work every day, Mo, and you get your salary and they say, we're gonna give you, let's say whatever, we're gonna give you, we're gonna give you a million dollars a year. Just sit here all day and do nothing. Most people could not handle that. They can handle it maybe for two weeks. And then they would go insane. And that was the test of the man. As you said, our souls are dry. We have nothing to do except for the man. We can't farm. What are they supposed to do all day? Torah study. But they, what are they studying? There's no tomorrow. So, so they were going insane. That's a very uh, important point Mo is making. Very important. Anyway, so then the, uh, you should do a, like a, a YouTube short for us. Like Torah, we'll put it out there. That would be very powerful, Mo. Yeah, I like that a lot. So then, then it states um, when the shara shemen was dough kneaded with oil. Rashi says lichuch shal shemen that they put in a little moistness of the oil. It tasted like the dough kneaded with oil. That's when Dunash explained it, and then it gives different parallels to it. Um, anyway, we're not going to go through that Rashi. Devar acher, we skip down to the bottom of that Rashi. Lashon lashad lashon natrukin. Layish shemen dvash. The word lashad is an abbreviation of kneading oil and honey. Ki isa nulav shabbat shemen. The man tasted like dough kneaded with oil. Uketufas bedash, smeared with honey. And the Unkos translates it as delish b'mishcha. No tell a petruno shaldash. This term goes towards Donash's interpretation that the dough is kneaded with oil. Oh, by the way, this is your, um, the next verse tells us Vayishma Moshe. Oh wait, I skipped. The pasuk says, "V'redes atal amachanel laila yered amon alav." And when the when the dew went down on the camp at night, the man would descend upon it. Vayishma Moshe sa'am and Moshe heard the people, "Bochel mishpachotav," crying with their families. Each lopetach alav. Each one at the entrance to his tent. Vayichar af Hashem ba'od u'beinei Moshe ra. And God was very upset. And the eyes of Moshe was very bad. What does it mean crying by their families? Mishpachos, mishpachos, ne'asafim. All the individual families would gather together, ubochim, and weep. The same tarumatan begaloi, to complain openly. Rabbosinu amru, but the Midrash says, l'mishpachosav, al iske mishpachos, al arayos and ne'asafim. They're crying over the fact that now they're forbidden to have relations with their family members. Vayomer Moshe Hashem. Moshe is frustrated now, frustrated because they just complained, and then they complained again. They asked for the the quail, and then they complained again about the man. So Moshe says to Hashem, "Lama hareosa avdecha v'lama lomatzasi chayin bein necha v'asum es masako amazelai." Why have what? Why have you done bad to your servant? Why have I not found favor in your eyes to put this whole burden on these people upon me? By the way, Moshe is just acting just like them. Is Moshe any better than them? It seems like his frustration is mirroring their frustration. But he's, be- he cares, they don't. Why do you say that? Because he's asking Hashem about about the responsibility. They're not taking any responsibility. They're complaining for the sake of complaining. Yeah, but Moshe Rabbeinu has said, why have you done evil to your servants? He just stood at Har Sinai three days ago. He just stood at Har Sinai 
Yeah, uh, and uh, why have we, I have not found favor in your eyes? You put this burden of this people on me. They gave two complaints, and all of a sudden they're a burden. I, I read a nice <laughs> commentary by by Rabbi Sachs about this. What uh, does he say? Well, that in the in back in Beshalach, um, Moshe had more empathy for them because he he felt they were hungry and they didn't know what they were doing. But he feels now that he's frustrated now because he feels like. They have had food to eat, and there will be food to eat, and they, they've they been in the desert longer, and they know more. And so they should have known better. They should have right. known better. And what well, were you saying, though? Uh, uh, shkoyach, Deborah, shkoyach. Uh, Tam so can go, like, their camp just got lit on fire because they complained, and now they're already doing it again. Yeah, but but so what? Moshe, he's supposed to be better. Why is he complaining? He's also complaining. Because this is a test for him. Yeah, but so why don't you say it's a test for them? I'm saying him. Why because he's the person? leader. It's a it's a test for the leader. He has to right. So out. he. So what I'm just saying is he shouldn't have been complaining himself. Well, what do you mean shouldn't? He's a human being. Okay, he's I'm just human. saying Moshe is, is committing the same sin that they're committing almost. Well, so uh, because he's just a man, and he. Uh, I, yeah, no, I'm definitely sympathetic to Moshe. I'm just pointing out. Yeah, I'm, dead, I'm not. Uh, God forbid, Moshe Rabbeinu was the greatest human being to ever live. The Torah tells us that. But I'm just pointing out that Moshe's frustrations are, as they say in the in the Latin, mutatis mutandis, the same frustrations as the people. They that, took this that, minor that's what's, problem. Going to make, that's what's going to make him a good leader, that he understands. In the end, he's going to understand their frustration. He's going to be with them. And, yeah. he's, and he's going to... But the problem out. is... The problem is that he's now at the end of it. This is not the beginning anymore. This is this is this is like the, they're just going to go down more and more and more and more. But, and never uh, we're, we're still in year two. Yeah, we're still in year two, but then we don't hear from Moshe between year two and thirty-nine. We don't hear from him. <laughs> because anyway, he's busy. He's busy learning how to be a leader. It's not easy. <laughs> oh, yeah.